thank you very much uh, for me ha uh, for having me here. Um, so we're going to talk about um, how to keep your secrets relatively safer on an Android device um, instead of just don't have any secrets at all. Uh, about me, I'm Jeroen Willemsen. I work for Xebia. I started as a software developer uh, over there. Had history before that, of course, but. Um, basically, we started up a security unit uh, over there, and I started to uh, do stuff regarding uh, secure software development, um, uh, making sure you do your agile risk management right, and all that other jazz, basically. So, today we're going to talk about Android. So, imagine you want to create an Android app. So, who of you is... I saw some hands while being a developer. Um, who of you actually does Android development? Awesome. Who of you actually um, tests Android apps, pen testing? All right, cool. Well, I expect lots of feedback, at least from you and from your developers at the end, hopefully. Um, basically, uh, we had a couple of findings over time in a few projects, and I assembled those into how we currently wrote a solution and like to share that with you. Um, let's just say you hardly have any NDK experience. Now, some of your Android developers will raise their hands. Do you do a lot of stuff in C++ or do you go Java all the way home? Who does Java all the way home? Okay, well then actually this presentation actually fits you. That's cool. After I went to AppSec Rome, I was the only guy doing Android in a talk about Android. So I kind of hope this wasn't the situation here. So cool that you guys are here. Really like it. Uh, anyway, if you're going to do this with just the SDK and you want to reduce, you know, the risk of memory dumping and leaking secrets and letting other people shaming you because you did stuff wrong, what do you have to do? So I set out to create the following talk and I wanted to talk first about authentication information. So how do you safeguard a PIN or a password? How do you make sure you can handle that securely? And then I wanted to talk about how to safeguard cryptographic keys because hopefully if you have a secret, then the actual secret will be the key with which you encrypted that secret. And I wanted to talk about the Android 6 Key Store, how awesome the Android Key Store is, although there are some risks regarding that, and how to do it yourself if you're not having the Android 6 Key Store over there, and what to do with Android Noga. And then this came along, a bunch of CVs which were luckily already patched in the uh, uh, security patch at, uh, from Google in May 2016. The only problem is, because it was patched, now the guy can brag, and you can just download executable code, so if it's not patched, and the Android key store isn't as secure as you want it to be. So I had to revise my presentation a little. If you want to, you, you'll find some details in the slide later on. Um, so yeah, we had to rewrite stuff. So starting at the beginning, how do you safeguard a PIN? Well, obviously a PIN is similar to a password. It's just relatively short. Um, and obviously some of you remember this, you know, the whole keyboard incident and stuff. Uh, and still now there are still many custom keyboards out there that are way worse than what uh, Samsung did. So where do you start with when you enter your, uh, your PIN? Right, you have to create your own custom keyboard. Well, basically what you can do is have a set of image views which you can click and some other set of images that represent the state of the entered password. The actual PIN should then go into a char array or a byte array and if you're done, you're gonna zero it out. Uh, never use immutable data structures. You see many people just put it in a string and then later on you just dump the app, let it crash or whatever, or worse, have uh, remote, uh, uh, remote checkings and then you're really in trouble. Obviously you need to root a device for that, so there's loss this and this and this, but the funny thing is many people use custom software on rooted devices, don't understand the app asks, another app has asked for root rights and now he can actually start getting into the memory. So therefore don't use strings and stuff, they end up in the heap and people can just read that. Well, not just anybody, but if you're good at, do at doing your job as a malware provider, so what do you do? Here's a little sample. So here we have an app. On top you have four images representing the entered pin. And all you do is just switch images in the image view. So for every number you enter, you just pop it up. It should be relatively easy. Over here you have a bunch of images representing buttons for your keyboard, so it's not really special. Uh, after that, you just have to add on clicknesses for everyone. This is the simplified version. If you want to do it really neat, you just need to provide separate click listeners with their own methods. And all you do basically is once somebody clicks a button, you enter, uh, you have another number and you put it in the, uh, uh, in the listener where you have the on key press method. Then the listener itself, basically uh, you go through, uh, 
if you're not at the max, you just add you just add items, um, and then you just set the image resource to filled. So somebody entered the pin over there. You go along, and when you're to when you're completed, you initialize something called the secure password wrapper. The secure password wrapper is actually nothing else than a static uh, data structure that holds the actual password, and you can do lots of things over there. But the basic idea is that the sooner you finish your operation, you want to clean it up again. We did it like this because we're providing a library that provides you a way to authenticate and you see that people just keep on putting the passwords everywhere in memory. In the end, some guys just have it globally anywhere, so um, where to stop, where to start cleaning basically. And what we then do, we, when somebody initializes the wrapper, you just uh, clone the password and then uh, you actually clean the password that you cloned and on the one that you store inside you can do encryption or obfuscation or any method you want to. So basically, if you now just dump something, you don't see the pin in memory, you see some weird stuff, and well, you go to another app where you do get it in memory. Um, so how do you handle it then? You can uh, have a, a working method to work with password. Over there, you provide a password work helper that implements some interface we'll discuss later. You deobfuscate, do the work, and then you could actually reset. So at the moment you did your work, you reset the pin, and you're done. So the moment that somebody could actually have ditched it out of memory is relatively short. Of course, you still might need a static reference to make sure you can always clean it if some of that work failed. And that's the way we can handle it. So that secure password helper is just an interface with the do work implemented. Obviously, at the do work, you shouldn't copy it to some other places. But this will help developers to at least keep the password in a single position, make sure it's hard to decrypt, etc. Of course, none of this really makes sense if we don't uh, make sure that in the end, whatever work you do, you always clean it. Of course, this is only just to make sure that you prevent memory dump attacks and that you prevent um, basic leaking of the whole thing. But you can go way further. And obviously, here's where you should already have the feeling like, wait a minute, this guy is always talking about memory dumping. I don't even care about that that much. How about transmitting? We'll get to that later. Um, but how far do you want to go with securing a password? There's tons of these little things you can think about. Um, who of you knows about this one or seen this picture in the past? Okay, um, there's been a lot of hassle about uh, making sure you secure your PIN correctly, that you authenticate correctly, etc., etc. But in the end, if somebody keeps on using your app continuously, then the smudges of his finger, this is called a smudge attack by the way, might just leak which characters are used, so there's no use in having all that extra stuff. That's how developers started to reason. So they came up with something very nifty. They just change the input on every key you enter, so you get a really weird change in keypad. And this is the moment you should start asking yourself, okay, how important was this authentication information again? How far do you want to go in starting to frustrate the user instead of keeping it secure? And of course, you can try to strengthen your story if you're having more factors. But of course, that will, well, here's actually the part you have to start thinking and start asking yourself, how far do I want to go in securing my uh, password itself? So, Anyway, one of the most important things you should remember, instead of going all that way, is make sure you at least authenticate against the server and not against just a device. Who of you has been to OPSEC? Who of you saw the talk, don't touch me like that? Okay, it's a good talk, you also check it out because they explain in a very nice way, again, more like the security style, why you shouldn't and then how you should, uh, why you shouldn't authenticate against a device and they show very clear samples of why not to do it. So again, just authenticate against a server. Okay, we did all that memory stuff, but how are we going to authenticate against a server now? Well, obviously you should never send it in clear text. I'm saying obvious, but it doesn't seem to be that obvious because nowadays people are still doing that, so that's fun. Instead, add padding, of course, dynamically generate a padding, store it, encrypt it somewhere else on the device, unfortunately, but at least you increase the space. And then you could use PKBDF2 or Scrypt or Bcrypt. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that stuff. Or you could go zero proof with a secure remote password. Just make sure if you use that, that you have a long enough verifier, because if you don't, well, Sony can tell you how that will work out. Um, oh yeah, and of course, again, always wipe it after processing, exception, etc. Um, well, there's a bunch of other things you can do. You could bind your authentication information to the device, like the pin padding. 
uh, well, there's a lot of network security stuff you need to do. You need to do your crypto right, of course, not do it yourself. Um, and you have to prevent uh, uh, unintended data leakage and all of this stuff, uh, client-side injection. There's many talks already given during beautiful meetups, during uh, actually AppSec sessions, which you should really check it out if you really want to do this right. Um, same holds for uh, routing or make reverse engineering harder. And in the end, cool thing is, OWASP oh, well, had lots of this stuff already to its Android testing cheat sheet. So I would like you to go there, um, learn from it, apply more controls if necessary, and add stuff, because it's not complete. We all learn, we all investigate. So please, please do. So that about the basic stuff for a PIN. Now, obviously, um, if you would have encrypted it or have encrypted the PIN padding or whatever, you need a key, right? So how are you going to safeguard the key? Well, we'll start with the Android 6 Key Store. Android Marshmallow came with a beautiful new uh, implementation of the Android Key Store. It was way better in the previous versions because it actually has a forced uh, backup in a trusted execution environment. Um, and given that, that's really nice. So um, the key store can do asymmetric uh, encryption operations for you. It can do signing, it can do macking. Uh, it can also store symmetric or asymmetric keys. It can generate keys as well. And the cool thing is the private key or the secret key does not leave the key store. You get a reference to it, and you can do your job with it, but it doesn't leave it. So that means that any attacker, well, if it just attacks your own application, it can't get to it because it needs to get into the key store. How? We'll talk about that later. Um, but most importantly, you have to follow the rules. There is a way to do this right, just do it like that. Google tells you to do that. I'm going to tell you exactly to do that, so just follow the examples, you'll be fine. So how does this work? So this is what the Android uh, developer website shows. It shows you the non-secure world over here, and there's a client which can start to make calls to a libkey master. So over here you ask for key generation or you ask for uh, uh, some crypto uh, actions. The libkey master then sends via wire format some stuff to the kernel interface, which then hooks, makes an up to the secure world, which is your trusted execution environment, where, well, what we call the secure world, and over there we start to do stuff. So how does that work? I'm just going to do it in general because obviously a Qualcomm has a different implementation of the trusted execution environment than uh, other uh, chipsets have. So for instance, you have your application and you say, okay, key store, generate a key for me. That will hook up into the Android framework that will then give a hook to the key store daemon, which is uh, an operating system process. So right now your operation just went out of your application process and went to the operation operating system. It will ask the client to do its stuff, go into the secure world, and then there you find the secure world application called a trustlet. And a trustlet will actually do the operation, like generating the key. So from now onward, your key actually resides over here. It doesn't reside over here. So that's a cool thing. So by now, if you start attacking stuff, unless you like the CVEs that are already in the slides and you can find blogs about, um, if you don't do the exploits, um, basically you're pretty secure over here. So that's cool. That's really cool. Um, by the way, if you have any questions in the meantime, let me know. Um, so the actual crypto does not take place in the app, which is cool. Key material will never enter the app process. And the nice thing is you can just ask whether your key is in the secure world or not. Um, well, again, there are a few bits over there, but or k beats. Um, so how does that work? When you, what type of protection does it apply? You can define, when you generate your keys, you already get in control, basically. You can define the authorization of what the key is authorized to or the purpose. You can say whether the user should authenticate or not. You can actually put some time validity over there and you can tell it that it has to be in secure hardware or not. So um, key authorization obviously needs to, should prevent from misusing the key material, which means that once you extracted the key to do something, if that would happen, you shouldn't be able to get, use it for something else than what the developer intended it to. You can define cryptography, which means for, let's say, you can use it for encryption or decryption. You can for, you could say what type of uh, block modes it supports. You could tell it whether uh, it should sign or verify. You can also define temporal validity, which means for how many seconds should this key be use usable when the user authenticated for it or when the, the key got created. And you can define whether a user should authenticate. So then the next question would, of course, be how can you authenticate? There's 
two ways basically. One is by providing a lock screen flow. So you can use uh, keyguard, the keyguard manager to create a confirmed device credential in TenFlow. And with that, the user gets uh, basically the lock screen presented and it's asked to unlock the device. And with that, you can just uh, unlock a key. Of course, you first have to ask whether this is possible. And you can just ask the keyguard manager, is it secure? This seems to work. There's only a few, well, challenges. Of course, if you remove the lock screen from the device, you also invalidate all the keys. So that means at the moment that the user is frustrated about his lock screen, about his lengthy swipe, and he wants to reset it, you lose your keys. So be aware of that. Um, and uh, um, the user, when he enters his lock screen, doesn't just unlock one key, but he unlocks all the keys. Yes? Yes. Oh yeah, there's a, I have to repeat this. There's a side note here that if you work with the key store and it, depending on how you configure it, it might just uh, stop you from uh, uh, unlocking the lock screen or removing the lock screen at all, which can indeed be quite frustrating. Luckily, there are ways to work with that, but not really recommended indeed. So, luckily there is another way. You can actually use your fingerprint. Um, there is a sad um, caveat. Uh, there are a few devices that got upgraded to Android 6, but they're not really Android 6 alike, like, oh, I should be careful, like the Galaxy S5, um, which has a fingerprint reader, has all the stuff, but it can only work with Samsung Pass because the reader isn't good enough, so be aware if you say all Android 6 devices support this, well, for instance this one and a few others don't. Um, there's another thing, when you add or remove fingerprints, you will invalidate keys as well, which again might end in the frustrating flow, because the user doesn't know that in advance. And the other thing, every registered fingerprint will unlock the requested key. So there is no coupling between the fingerprint and the key. In fact, Google says in its requirements for Android 6 that there should not be such a thing. You should never be able as an app developer to see which fingerprint you're using. That means that if somebody else, well, there's been a lot of uh, media attention about this, saying that, ooh, are you really aware that if your partner is also registered at your phone, then she can use your banking stuff? Well, obviously, because it's a shared device now. Shouldn't the apps be shared then as well? But it's the way, it depends on how you look at it. So, how do you use this stuff? Um, you start with, oh yeah, how do you first ask whether it's inside the hardware? Because that's something we didn't cover. So let's say you got your secret key reference from the Android key store. Then you set up a, a secret key factory and there you uh, uh, basically request a key info object. That key info object will just have a method is inside secure hardware. If it's true, it should be secure and otherwise um, you get into it. You'll, it shouldn't be. Of course, having just such a Boolean method is, well, depending on the underlying software, this is still, you can still manipulate this. In Android N, they have a solution for this. That's cool, in Android Noga, but this is still, you can still manipulate this, unfortunately. Um, however, manipulating this is way harder than just getting your key out of your code. So, there you have it. Um, oh yeah, there's a few things. What is in secure hardware? Well, temporal validity isn't, because there's no clock in a trusted execution environment. So you can't enforce temporal validity pr uh, properly. Um, so if you really want to rely on that fact, you can't, because it's in user mode, so you can manipulate that. Um, you can ask the key info whether uh, you have hardware enforcement of user authentication, which is cool. And uh, luckily, all purpose definitions are defined and enforced by the HAL and TE, so that's cool. Um, so how do you, let's say you want to generate a key and then start using it. So for that, you, for, for uh, a secret key, you need another generator object, but for having a public-private key pair, you use a key pair generator. You uh, instantiate it from the key store, and then from there onward, um, you start initializing it. Over here, you provide the purpose. Yeah, Like we said, we're not going to use this for encryption and decryption, but just to sign and verify. 
and we can also set the digest that we're allowed to use um, and specific stuff for the RSA key pair. And this time it's, for instance, the key length and uh, uh, the, um, the public modulus. Um, we want users to authenticate, for instance, and we could set a temporal validity. And then we start generating and we get ourselves a key pair. Now, how do you retrieve that stuff? Public key is quite easy. You just ask, you load the key store and you ask, get the certificate under the key name where we just stored it. The key name is the alias. And then we get the public key. That's cool. We can actually do something similar for the private key. You can just ask again, load it. The only cool thing is you can't do get encoded. You'll get into an exception or you'll get null depending on the actual implementation because it's stored in the key store. So you can't get it out. So that's a good thing right in most cases it is of course um, so let's say we start using this for a signature based on our m pin and some padding and stuff and we can have ourselves some authentication methodology basically that's nice but what if you want to skip all that and just do it with your fingerprint here we go um, of course there's multiple steps ahead so let's just first quickly jump through the steps that you have to do it's a bit, when we were implementing this and we're reviewing this, we found it a bit weird that you're doing some steps almost like twice. So um, you can actually do it wrong many times. That's also why Don't Touch Me that way was probably given during AppSack. Again, really, if you want to do fingerprint stuff, check that presentation out as well. And if you see your code doing something similar to what they say don't do, well, then at least you have some proper negative samples there. It's a really good presentation. You've got to check it out as an Androidian, really. Um, so, the first thing you do is start doing some checks. Do we have the hardware? Do we have the correct Android version? Do we have the security in place? All that jazz. Then we're going to ask, um, or then we're going to create a signature object, the one where which you're actually going to do the sign operation. Next, you're going to create a callback, a callback that can be fired the moment the user tries to authenticate using his fingerprint. And with that callback and the signature object, we're going to authenticate against the fingerprint manager and then just wait for the user to do his stuff and hopefully successfully do the signature, all right? So step zero, let's start doing the checks. First check, of course, well, you can either uh, always have that stupid, or you can just target Android Marshmallow. So you have a few users, or you have to start checking for Android versions. And the other way around is just using the fingerprint manager compat, because that will just, on Android M, uh, Marshmallow and higher, just use a fingerprint manager if it's there. In a lower Android versions, it will act like there's no fingerprint manager, so you don't have to do all the escaping and stuff. Um, next, you're just gonna ask the fingerprint manager to uh, check if the hardware is there, which you can see over here, is hardware detected. Obviously, you first have to check whether the permission was granted by the user, which you also request in your uh, manifest. So, so far, so good, right? Next, of course, you need to make sure that you actually are working on a secure device where you can use a trusted execution environment, and for that you need the key, the lock screen to be enabled. Next, um, you can't do anything unless you have fingerprint enrolled. So, first check that. And lastly, about those uh, um, vulnerabilities they found and patched, if you really want to make sure you handle this, of course, this is a bit too much for many applications, but what you could do is check um, the build version security patch, which is a string, but we found on most platforms, it's just a date which you can parse like this, and then you know, okay, is this okay or not? Um, and then, well, if it's a lower patch version, you could at least call home saying there might be some risk if you have a high risk application, and otherwise just continue. And obviously for fingerprints, because of all the vulnerabilities that have been found, in the last few months, you might want to have a server-side skill switch and make sure that it's not enabled so you can continue using your fingerprint. Then next, of course, is actually starting to do stuff. So first we need to get a signature object. So we ask the key store for one, um, and we in initialize it with our privacy generator private key. Next, we need to create a callback. Now the callback is, uh, uh, is actually coming from, is an, uh, uh, is basically a fingerprint manager authentication callback, which has four methods that you should always be aware of. Uh, the first one gives an authentication error when something went wrong, when the user didn't hit the screen right, or when something else went wrong. Uh, authentication failed just basically means that, well, the finger wasn't recognized, it's not there. 
authentication succeeded is of course the one we're interested in. And on authentication help, you could provide the user some standard helping message about putting your finger correctly on the sensor, making sure everything is right. Next, if you have that callback, you're going to authenticate against the fingerprint manager, which is, well, you have to do a few things to, in order to be able to authenticate. First, you generate, a, uh, you create a crypto object, which comes from the fingerprint manager. Over there, you have to, uh, well, you have to initialize it with the signature object you created earlier. So as you can see, you have to stack stuff weirdly to get the fingerprint working, but this is how to do it. You have to provide a cancellation signal so you can cancel the operation programmatically if necessary. And then you can start uh, authenticating. This here is quite funny, by the way. If you look at the Android uh, documentation, it says flags, best be zero. Then you try to look up the flags, but there's no specification. Um, and then you have some nil. Well, this can be any callback, any handler you want to have to handle actual callback results. The other thing you can just do is just use... Um, the earlier provided uh, a callback to handle it. So, well, whatever you want to do there, basically. So next, the user does stuff, and based when the user was successful, you, well, you remember, you get your own authentication succeeded, and there you have your result, and the result we're interested in. So let's say we pass the result on for pretty printing on the slide. Um, from that result, you need to get the crypto object, which is now authenticated, so it's a bit weird you're having these two crypto objects eventually. Um, and then you get the signature from the crypto object and then you can update it with the, for instance, some transaction you want to sign and then you sign it. And then you can move along with the data. Yes? Previous slide. Previous slide. Why do you have to ask on success when you're already in an on succeeded? Oh, I only did that to make the code fit on the slide actually. Sorry about that. <laughs> You can do anything here, of course. So, um, That's your yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just going there, basically. Yes. Um, there's a few more notes. Uh, you have to prepare for a bunch of exceptions, like invalid key exception, unrecoverable key exception, key store exception, because even though this is a very nifty feature, it's not that error prone, but if you have a high volume of usage, you'll run into some trouble, basically. So make sure you handle those correctly and you make your app deal with that. Uh, and there's no password protection. Remember in Bouncy Castle, Uber's Key Store, and JKS and Bakers, at least there was a, pa uh, a password. Well, this one doesn't support it anymore. So you can no longer programmatically uh, enforce um, some additional measures like a password. Um, well, a few don't forget me nuts. Um, still, you have to apply uh, key lifecycle management, including key rotation. Just make sure you take care of all that jazz, because even though this is a secure storage, you still have to manage that. Um, well, uh, don't use this if it's really high risk that you're trying to protect. And there is a beautiful cheat sheet again against about. Uh, uh, key management, and um, if you're really interested in making in doing this right, I really found it helpful. Well, we apply when we basically compare the stuff that we do com compared to a cheat sheet. I found it very nice. It was easy to read, also for people that don't care that much about security but just want to know how to do things right. This really helps. So that's cool. Again, if you want to add stuff to it, go. Um, okay, so. What's good about it, what isn't? What's good about it is that you no longer have your key material in memory, which is cool. Everything happens in the secure world. Again, cool. As you saw, even though the fingerprint stuff was a bit hard, the rest was pretty easy. It's just standard programming stuff. You don't have to take a lot into account, actually. Just prepare yourself for the exceptions. And every key has a clear purpose, so you can't trick yourself into doing stupid stuff because at the moment that you're writing your code, because you thought you need this key specifically for signing, you're not going to reuse it for something entirely different, making that key even more important. Um, and you can only share public keys, which is nice. At the other end, um, uh, you're very dependent on the actual implementation. You have no control over this. Uh, it's not like we're the vendor, it's not like we're Google. So as long as they do it right, we have to believe in that, basically. But as you already saw, the vulnerabilities being patched is not perfect yet and probably won't be in the upcoming time. 
that's why luckily Android Noga comes into play. And there's no password protection, so for those who love to use passwords on Bouncy Calls or Uber, you can't. Key and validation errors just can be very nasty, so you have to start re-registering everything. There's a relatively small user base to this thing right now, so you have to be patient. And again, you can only share the public key. So what about semantic keys? Just to cover it all up. Instead of a signature, you can first use a Mac object, and you can use ciphers as you actually used to, hopefully. Um, or remember, you couldn't get a public key out. The same holds for the symmetric key. So that's about the Android key store. But what if you do not have an Android M key store? I'm still going to do the security thing, tell people what not to do. You shoot in hard code. Well, everything speaks for itself on the slide. Just don't store it in encrypted. Don't store it encoded or obfuscated. And for those developers that thought that the Java key store actually provides proper encryption, it doesn't. Sorry. Um, two more caveats. Um, when you do asymmetric cryptography, you're relying on big integers. Big integers are immutable structures that keep in your application forever. So if you want to keep your application alive through everything, you're actually holding your secret key in memory. That's fun. Um, and when you do symmetric keys and you want to clean up your symmetric keys in memory again, you know, to do proper cleaning, you're again a little bit of a hassle. Why, you might ask. Um, hopefully some of you do. Um, well, the problem is the secret key implementation itself. So let's just quickly go over this. Just to make sure, to whom of you is this stuff new, the Java key stuff? And to whom of you it's still interesting? Awesome! Luckily! Okay, because I saw some sleepy faces already, sorry about that. So, um, uh, basically every key needs to implement a, an interface. It's get algorithm, get format, and get encoded. Um, when you use a secret key for your AES-based ciphers, you get into trouble. Because the moment you do get encoded and then you get the array that you back up the key which you want to clean, you don't get the backing up array, you get a copy of that. So you can't clean the key. Wait, what? Why? We don't know either, but you can fix this. Um, what we did is just create your own secret key. Bear in mind, this is not doing your own crypto. This is just manipulating the key data structure. Only that. Never try to go beyond this. Never try to do, oh, now I'm getting the security guy. Okay, um, never mind. Um, what we did was the following. We created a secret key, which has its own internal key, which implements secret key, obviously, and destroyable. Um, Java guys, you know destroyable? Raise your hands if you do. Raise your hands if you don't. Awesome. So, destroyable does the following. It's an interface that just says, um, that has two methods, destroy and is destroyed. Those using Android Noga, well, you can use this, but those in the old Android world, implement it yourself. What it does, right now what we did, is just make sure that the internal key uh, has two methods. It implements destroy, so we zero out the actual uh, key that's the data structure within our secret key holding the byte array, and is destroyed, we just ask are you nulled. But before the nulling, we at least fill it with zeros. Um, there's a bunch of ways how to fill this. A for loop is also sufficient, no worries. You don't have to rely on newer methods that are not supported by all the uh, Android versions. And basically your secret key now, when you ask for a new key, you provide the internal key. And then you can ask the secret key to clean itself, which it then will just check, is this really a destroyable one? Okay, cool, let's destroy this stuff. So now you can actually wipe your keys from memory. So the old argument of not encrypting everything because keys were in memory, no longer holds. That's fun. Um, Want to go further? Again, you can do stuff to make sure that when you dump uh, your application's memory, you can't really find the key. But um, yeah, if you want to. How about storage? Um, yeah, this is a funny thing. If you don't have the Android 6 key store, or Noga for that matter, you don't have any hardware backup by default. Well, you have some certificate-based stuff called the keychain, but we'll not cover that because it has tons of other challenges. Um, but one thing you could do is you could actually just store it on your shared preferences and encrypt it with the key from the server. So that way you at least need that key. Obviously you have to do your IV right and all the other jazz, but that's another topic. Or, like I already told, you could use Bouncer Console Server, which is another key store coming from the Bouncer Console Security Provider, and they do encrypt the keys at rest. Nice. That's really useful. Um, okay. So, how does this sums up? Well, you can actually just wipe it from memory. That's cool. You have control over the contents of the key, 
mostly depending on what happened to lower layers of your operating system. Uh, storage can be hard because you need to rely on your own mechanism or bounce your calls to Uber or storage in some database using SQL Cypher, but then you have to protect that again and, well, we're off to a race of where to store the password. Um, and if you want to support multiple algorithms and not just AES but different things, you have to do more with your secret key and you have to do it right, so it becomes a bit more complicated. Uh, and take good care per Cypher HMAC implementation. Um, take good care, yeah, because if you it's not just about your data structure of the key, it's also how it's used in the HMAC, whether it's leaked or not. Um, for instance, with AES, who knows AES? Awesome, so I can just quickly jump over this. Basically, on the right hand side, you see what happens with the key, on the left hand side, you see how these round keys, which are uh, derivatives of your actual key, being used in the uh, AES operations. Over here you see uh, an AES trainer, which is really nice. And you see the key on top, right, with the red square. Where do you s does anybody see a repetition of that pattern? I see one guy not. Where do we see it? Around one. Exactly, it's still there. So it's inside some sort of worker key. So if you want to make sure it's not leaked, you have to make sure that those round keys are cleaned up as well. Exactly, round one, here we go, which is of course how it works. Now looking at Bouncy Castle, they have a bunch of working keys, um, and you should be able to actually still find the actual key as a working key. In other words, it's not cleared. You can easily fix this. Just a reinitialize the cipher, reuse it again with another key and a random data structure, just some randomly generated key, and you're fine. But just clean it up properly, and you're all done. Um, well, that sounds like a lot of complicated stuff, and you still have to manage this properly. So is there any hope? Yes, there is. Android Noga, or at least that's what the developer preview says. Um, what it will do, first of all, if you enroll new fingerprints, you will not have the standard behavior of uh, key revocation, which is very nice. Um, and there's key at the station support. So you have your X509 at station certificate signed with some uh, key injected in the device when the device was manufactured. And you can actually check that key uh, because it's a well-known certificate. And you can check a lot of other stuff. Like, for instance, is it still in a verified boot state? So, ergo, there's no custom firmware. The chance of it being rooted is way smaller. Us actually talking to a real key store is... Well, you have better chances of doing so. So that's really nice. For that I would like you all to um, check the developer render website and unfortunately for the attestation to work correctly, you probably, well, for you as a developer to use it everywhere, uh, you probably have to wait another development release, but that will be pretty soon. That's it. Questions? Well, none? Thank you, Jeroen.